morning, church. It is a wonderful day. After many, many weeks and months now, waiting for my family to arrive, they have finally come to Australia. And after two weeks of quarantine, they have come out of quarantine just last week. And it has been a great last few days with them all. So today, we have moved just last week as well into a house. And the whole family is here, and today I want to get you guys to meet Isabella and Benji. Can you, what are we going to say, Benji? Welcome. Oh, welcome. And Isabella? Happy Sabbath. That is, that's a very warm welcome for all of you guys watching our online service today. So why don't you stay with us, and now I'm going to take inside... And we're going to share a powerful message from the Word of God for each one of you guys today. You have a lovely Sabbath. Good morning and happy Sabbath. I would like to welcome you today to our service. And before we have our Bible study, I'd like to encourage you to have a prayer with me. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, and praise you for the blessings of your Sabbath. We want to ask that you may bless us now with your Holy Spirit to our Bible study. Lord, you are gracious and marvelous. And all of the things that you do, Lord, is for our benefit. So in, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray for your blessings as we open your Bible and we understand it. In Jesus we thank you. Amen. So today, I have a very special um, invite for all of you. I would like to encourage you to save on your calendar the 1st of, Jul the 1st of August as the first Sabbath that we're going to come together and resume our normal church service. So all of, for all of our members and uh, you know regular att attendees, please save that date. 1st of August, we're going to come together. We are making plans. I can't reveal everything yet to you. But next Sabbath, we want you to tune in again and listen to what the plans are. For you they are visiting or for you they are just listening to our, our online services, our online Bible study whether you have attended our church in the past or whether you have never attended our church, I also have the same invitation for you. I would like you to save the date for the 1st of August, Sabbath. Perhaps put in a calendar from 9 o'clock to 12, sometime between that, we're going to have our first service. And we want you to come and join us physically under the same place with all of our people. For this amazing and beautiful Sabbath that we're going to be spending together. So make plans. Save the date. And make sure they will be there. No. Don't be worried. Don't be stressed. If you have never attended a church. Or have never come and join us. Or you don't know anybody. I'm telling you. There will be other people there in the same boat. One of them will be my wife. She hasn't attended our church here. And that will be her first time with the children. So you won't feel lonely or you won't feel that you're the only weird one. There will be many more of us. Okay? So make sure that you save the date that you can be there as well. Alright. Today I have a Bible study for us to do. And before we begin our Bible study, I want to ask you a question. And I want to encourage you to pause the video and have a discussion about the question I have for you. Here's the question. Is COVID-19 the greatest sign that Jesus is soon to come? Well, what do you think? I want you to pause the video, have a chat to your brothers or sisters or to your uh, family members in your house. And I want to have a discussion about that. It is very important. Thank you for having the discussion. 
I can only guess what you guys have discussed in your house today. But here's what I believe many of you guys have a dis had a discussion on. If COVID-19 is the greatest signs of Jesus' second coming, I want to know. Why? Because I need to get ready. Why? Well, I need to prioritize the right things in my life. And at the moment, there are things that are not priority for God. So they should not be priority for me if I believe that He's coming. And the other thing is, I have many members of my family, my friends and neighbors, where I have never told them that Jesus is coming. And if He is coming right now, in my generation, they ought to know. I must tell them. But on the other hand, Pastor Dadder, if COVID-19 is not the greatest sign of Jesus' second coming, and COVID-19 is just another event like the 9-11, where people get excited, things will come to normality, life goes on. I don't want to be seen as a fanatic Christian. I don't want to be seen as someone that is only hyped up by the events of history. And I don't want people to say that I am a false Christian for trying to set a time of Jesus' second coming. By every time that there is a big event on our planet, people see there as Jesus, a sign of Jesus' second coming. We have had many of them in the past. And Jesus has not yet come. So, Pastor Dada, a good answer for this question is very important and vital for my own spiritual life and the way I will live my life for, for, from now on. Isn't that right? What do you think? Well, I believe that that was some of your discussions as you had a discussion today. Okay. Let me tell you another story. And then with that, I want to answer the question. And I want to show you something that I believe is very important for you to know. I went to visit someone a little while ago. Perhaps a long time ago. And as I visit this family, um, they haven't come to church for, for years. And um, as I asked them, and I said, look, what, what, what happened? You know, how, why, why have you stopped coming to church? What, what happened in your faith? Well, they went on to explain to me. Pastor Dada, we have been raised as Seventh-day Adventists. You know, we are, our parents were Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, we have, you know, our kids, we, we grow up in the church. We have heard many times that Jesus was going to come. He never came. And uh, we have also learned about Ellen White, and we have always believed that Ellen White was a true prophet. But it wasn't until we diving into her books and to study more about her and what she wrote to people that we found a few things very disturbing. And they went on to tell me a few, some of the things. And these were the things that they found. They said, look, Ellen White is said to be a true prophet, but she wrote in a personal letter to a to um, some young woman that they shouldn't get married because Jesus was soon to come. And they shouldn't make that the focus of their lives, but they should make Jesus and God priority in their lives. And they shouldn't get married. They also told me that they found some letters that have been published uh, from Ellen White to family, to families where she encouraged the parents to devise different plans for their children and not to send them to college. Because if Jesus was coming in their generation, as she believed, there were other important things for them to do in preparing themselves for Jesus' second coming and to go to college. And they say, well, Ellen White, in many public letters and other books, she have urged the people and have encouraged them, saying that Jesus was coming in their generation and they must get ready. And you know what, Pastor Dada? Jesus never came. Ellen White passed away. Everybody else that she wrote a letter to passed away. And if she was a true prophet and a true disciple of Jesus, whether even doubt that she was a true disciple of Jesus, she would know that Jesus was not coming during her time. And she would not have encouraged people to do or to prevent them of doing such things like getting married, going to college, and other things in their own personal life. Well, I confess to you that I did not know what to answer and what to say. So I went to go home 
and to study my Bible and to study more and understand more about what God says about this. And the answer is very relevant to what I have asked you guys to have a discussion on. Whether we should take the COVID-19 as a great sign of Jesus' second coming or not. Whether we should just sit down and wait to see what happens after in order for us to decide whether we're going to go and preach or not. So, these are very relevant. And I want to share with you guys a few things that I learned from the scripture. So, the first thing that I want to share with you guys is a passage from Paul. Right? Um, and it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And Paul writing this big letter to the church of Corinthians. He says, he's on verse 29. He says, But these I say, brethren, the time is short, so that from now on, even those who have wives should be as thought they had none. That's a bit strange, right? What is Paul writing to the church of Corinthians saying? He said, look, if you're married... Because the time is short and Jesus is coming. What should you do? Well, like, you should focus on other things. Let's have a look what he says in verse um, 32. He says, But I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried, care for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married, cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. So what is Paul saying? He says, well, if you can, you should avoid personal relationship with your wife. Intimacy, personal intimacy, or intimacy relationship with your wife, because you must spend time caring for the things of the Lord. His coming is so short, is a hand, and if you just are concerned about how to please your wife, you may not know how to please the Lord. Well, let me ask you this very straight and simple question: Was Paul a false prophet? Didn't Paul knew? Didn't Paul know that Jesus was not coming in his generation? Why is Paul counseling the church members of the Church of Corinthians to do and to have such a behavior? Isn't that interesting? And the only guess that I have is that Paul is working under the instruction of Jesus Christ. That's right. He's working under the instruction of Jesus Christ. Have a look, Matthew chapter 24, and see what Jesus says. Um, in one of his last sermons, and how he warns people what to do and what not to do. Just what he says. Chapter 4, 24 of Matthew, verse 36, he says, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Verse 37, But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. And then Jesus says in verse 44, Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. So what is the instruction that Jesus have given to his disciples, including Paul? The instruction was, well, you, when you, when I bide you to come and follow me, that you become a true disciple of Jesus, of me, your first priority should be the second coming of Jesus Christ, my second coming. And therefore, not even marrying, getting in marriage, drinking, all normal things in life should become priority in your life. That should be secondary. So Paul now writes the letter to the church of Corinthians, and that's exactly the message that he portrays. Why? Because Paul believed that Jesus was coming in the time that he wrote the letter to the church of Corinthians. So he's urging them. And that's not out of nothing. He's urging because Jesus had told them to do so. Well, let me read another, another, another prophet in the, in the New Testament, right? Um, let me read Peter. Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4, um, 1 Peter chapter 4, let's have a look, um, verse 7, look what Peter says, he says this, to the church he writes, but the end of all things is at hand, therefore be serious and watchful in your praise. So Peter is writing here at the end of the first century, and what is he saying to the church? He's writing to the whole church, all the churches, and he says, please, be watchful 
in prayers, be serious about it, because the end is at hand. Jesus is coming, and he says, right now is the time for you to show love above all things to one another. Did Peter believe that Jesus was coming in his generation? The answer is yes. Did he wrote about that? Yes. Did he encourage the church members of his own generation to be ready for Jesus was coming? Yes. Did he encourage them to make their relationship right with one another in order to prepare for Jesus' second coming? The answer is yes. Let's have a look what James says. James chapter 5, uh, a few pages before, James chapter 5, verse 8. Look what James says. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So what is, what is James saying? Say, look, establish in your heart, put in your heart that Jesus is coming. Believe that. And then you go on and live a godly life. The first thing that he says that we must do is, on verse 9 he says, Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge, Jesus Christ, is standing at the door. So what is, what is James encouraging the church? He's encouraging the church to get ready for Jesus' second coming by making the relationship good with one another. Did James believe that Jesus was coming in his generation? The answer is yes. Did he encourage the church to be ready for Jesus' second coming at his first um, in the first or second century? Yes. Did he believe that? Yes. Isn't that interesting? Paul, James, Peter. But not only them. Let me tell you another one. John. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1 verse 3. This is what John says. John says this. He writes to seven churches. Seven churches. And he says to them, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this book and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is, is near. For the time is near. So did John believe that Jesus was coming in his own generation? Yes. Did he write to the churches encouraging them to be ready for Jesus' second coming? Yes. Was John a false prophet? No. Was Peter a false prophet? No. Was James a false prophet? No. Was Paul a false prophet? No. They were not. They were all living their lives under the guidance of Jesus Christ. And how Jesus have encouraged them to live a life. Everyone that he has bind them to follow him and to become his disciples, he has given them very clear instructions on how to live their own lives. And they were to live every day of their lives if Jesus were coming in their own generation. Isn't it fascinating? So this is what I found. After studying the scripture and comparing the scripture with the scripture, uh, prophet with prophet, I found that a true prophet of Jesus Christ is the one that not only lives and believes that Jesus is coming, but is also encouraging everybody that he knows, writing letters to them and telling them to make Jesus priority in their lives, not the things of this world. And if possible, even to the most normal things like getting married, that they should consider that as less important than the preparation for Jesus' second coming. So did all of the prophets in the New Testament. So did Ellen G. White. She not, she not only believed that, she lived that, and she encouraged everyone in her generation that Jesus was coming. So my brothers and my sisters, what I found in the scripture, it's something, something amazing. That the scripture have encouraged us, despite where you're living, what time you're living, that you must be living and believing that Jesus is coming pretty soon. Let me read for you another passage in the scripture. Uh, and that's found in Matthew chapter 24, right? It's one of Jesus' parables, chapter 24 of Matthew. This is what Jesus says. He says that at the end, well, when he comes, he will find two groups of people living on this earth. Just two groups of people. You are either one or the other. And he says here that will be the faithful and the unfaithful servant. So you can either be a faithful or unfaithful. And he says this. Who then, verse 45 of chapter 24, who then is a faithful and wise servant? 
whom his master made ruler of, over his household, to give them food and due season. So he is the servant, which the master have made him a ruler of his own house, and he gave to the servant the responsibility to give food in due season to his own fellows, to the other servants. So he's one servant upon the other servants, and his responsibility is to care for them. And then he says, Blessed is, is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find him doing that. Doing what? Giving food to his servants, to his fellow servants. And then he says in verse 48, But if the evil servant says in his heart, I found it fascinating, and I'll tell you why. When he says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming, and then he begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunk words. So this is what happens, right? Jesus says in these last days there will be two groups of people. Either you'll be faithful servant or an unfaithful servant. The faithful servant is the one looking after the other servants and, do, and giving them due food in due season. But the unfaithful servant, the first thing that happens, he put in his heart that the Lord is not coming. Have you been tempted to think that COVID-19 is not a sign of Jesus coming? Have you been tempted to think that Jesus is not coming in your generation, in your lifetime? Jesus is a sign for the unfaithful servant. He put in his heart first that the Lord is not coming. And then the next thing that he does Interesting. The next thing that he does, instead of looking after and carrying his own servants, the servants of the, his Lord, his own fellow servants, he begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunk words. Jesus is not talking here about a physical beating. Jesus is not talking here about um, you going you know, against your brother and sister and give them a punch. He's talking here about you know, he's speaking evil of one another. He's talking here about mistreating one another. He's talking here about, you know, gossiping. He's talking here about lack of love towards one another, where we show no respect, we show no, no love, no consideration. And I found that interesting because both, Paul, both Peter and James, when they counsel the church saying that Jesus is coming, they said to them that you must show fervent love to one another. But Jesus says the unfaithful servant doesn't show a fervent love. He beats one another. He creates fight, dissension, intrigue. And that's, what, that's, that's, that's the sign of an unfaithful servant. And then he says that this unfaithful servant, after he does that, he finds no pleasure of eating and drinking of his own fellows. So he is going, who he is going to spend time eating and drinking and socializing with? With the outsiders, the drunkards. Isn't that fascinating? I, I was reading this and I was like, Lord, thank you for giving me such a powerful message. Thank you for giving me such a powerful insight. The insight I had from this parable is that in these last days, many of us could run the risk of putting in our hearts that Jesus is not coming. And then we start having disagreement. We start having fights and gossips with, against one another in the church. And the next thing that we do, that we spend our social lifetime with the outsiders. And we find more pleasure in spending time with them than we find in spending time with our own fellow servants. That the Lord has given for us to look after one another. And I don't know. It may be that one or two of you that are watching our message today have found much more pleasure socializing, drinking and eating with non-believers than you have found pleasure with Jesus' own servants. And most of us have run the risk sometime in our life to speak evil of one another. But I found this powerful because what the Lord is saying is, what Jesus himself is saying is, I want every disciple of mine to live every single day if I was coming in their lifetime. And therefore, you must have good relationship with one another. You must show fervent love. You must care for one another. And I'm warning you that you shall not put in your heart that I'm the lying. Because if you let that happen... You won't find any pleasure being with your own fellows. 
but you find more pleasure of being with the outsiders. And I say, Lord, thank you for giving me this sign. So now I know whether in my heart is the desire or whether in my heart is the thought that you're not coming. Because this thought that Jesus is not coming is not here, I need to pray and ask Jesus to put that thought again that I become a faithful servant of the Lord. My brothers and my sisters, the greater question is, is COVID-19 the greatest sign of Jesus' second coming? And the answer is, it doesn't matter. Why? Because like 9-11 have come and have passed. It may be the COVID-19 pandemic will come and pass. And that does not matter. Our spiritual life should not be relying on the signs of Jesus' second coming. The way we live and portray ourselves, the way we behave, the way we prepare ourselves for Jesus' second coming should never be based on the signs of His coming, but on our relationship of Jesus Christ. It should be relying on our belief that Jesus is coming anytime soon. And our priorities should express that belief. The life that you and I live today should express the belief that Jesus is coming very shortly. Our desire and our eagerness to tell our neighbors, our brothers, our sisters, our family members, all of our friends that Jesus is coming should never be based on the signs, but on our relationship with Jesus Christ. And Jesus has urged every single disciple from the first century up until now. And this is how I know that Ellen White was a true blue disciple of Jesus. Because she had believed that, she had urged, she had preached if Jesus was coming in her own generation. And a good sign that you and I are a true blue disciple of Jesus and a believer is that we find more pleasure mingling with our own brothers and sisters, giving food for each one of them. That we have this fervent love to one another. Words of encouragement. Words of, of love. Not words of condemnation. Words of appreciation. Not words of criticism. Words that builds them up. Not words that destroys their character. We must be found to be a true disciple of Jesus. When we choose to prioritize Jesus over the things of this world. When the things of this world are not more important to us than Jesus' second coming and sharing that Jesus will come pretty soon. So I want you today to know that you also can be a true blue disciple of Jesus by putting or letting God to put in your heart that belief that He is coming pretty soon. And whether COVID-19 is a sign or not, it does not matter. It shall never impact the way you live your life. Your life should be according or upon the belief that Jesus could come at any time. And through your choices and your lifestyle, you shall demonstrate that. For the glory of Jesus Christ. Not for the assurance of your salvation. But you glorify the name of Him who have loved you so much and so dearly. They have given His own begotten Son, that you and I may not perish, but that we may have eternal life in Christ Jesus. So I want to encourage you by reading this last passage here, found by, uh, said by Jesus Christ Himself. And this is how He has encouraged us to live in these last days. He says to my brothers, um, the disciples, He says to them, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe, O oh, see me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, that you may be also. You know, God says, what is priority for you here on this earth should never be anymore. Make me and my Father priority. Because we will take care of the rest for you. Don't worry about building a house here. Don't worry about establishing yourselves with wealth in this world. I have loved you so much. My Father has loved you so much. That we have gone up to heaven to prepare a place for you. That you don't make the priority for you. But your preparation and the preaching of Jesus' gospel shall be the priority for each one of us. 
May God bless you. May you enjoy your Sabbath. And may you make plans to reunite with all of us together again on the 1st of August. God has greater blessings for you and He has for me as well. So let's pray together that that day may come very shortly. Both Jesus' second coming and also the 1st of August when we meet together. Heavenly Father, we want to praise you and thank you for this beautiful Sabbath. We want to thank you, Lord, for the blessings you have given to each one of us. And Lord, I want to ask you that you may help us not to focus in the signs of the times, but Lord, in Jesus Christ, our Savior. I pray, Jesus, that you may encourage and put in our hearts the desire to see you coming. That we may never distrust your promise. That we may always believe that you're coming very shortly. In Jesus, we thank you. Amen.